Recording in progress. Thank you. All right, board members, I see one, two, three, and me makes four, and we need Supervisor Simidian. And Nancy, when Supervisor Simidian appears, if you'll please take a roll call vote to reestablish the existence of a quorum. We go. Okay, and we'll do that. Thank you very much. Paul Lorenz, I see that you're there. You'll be reporting on item 20 in just a moment. I'll give Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian may be having some technical difficulties because I do not see him in the room. Okay, let's resume our meeting and we will start with item number 20, which is a report back on the nursing recruitment, retention and safety at our Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Thank you, President Wasserman, members of the board. Let me catch my breath if you don't mind. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it's an exciting thing to come back to the board meeting. I, I totally understand that. It's well, you know, one of the things that uh, I will share with the board is that I just had the opportunity to do- Supervisor, uh, apologies. Uh, I, I think we still need to take a roll call to- Yes, please do. The supervisor's board. committee and is, is here. Yes. Go right ahead, Nancy. Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. I want to make sure Paul gets back to his story of whatever he's excited about. So don't well, just didn't want to lose that. He, he will. If you know Paul, he, it's coming. Okay. And Supervisor Wasserman is here too. Thank you, Nancy. And President Wasserman. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I just had the opportunity to come um, down from the hospital floor from the OB department. Uh, we started a program called the DAISY Award, which acknowledges nurses that do extraordinary things for our patients. Um, and, you know, I'll give more information on the DAISY Award later, but I think this is one of the things that I want to point out that the most we can do in terms of uh, supporting our nurses is actually to acknowledge the incredible work they do uh, and show that they bring immense value to the system. Um, so I could not miss the opportunity to be up there along with the other nurse leaders to acknowledge uh, these nurses. And uh, so, of course, I'm out of breath, out of shape, <laughs> writing back to the board meeting here. But, you know, I, I just can't, uh, you know, say enough about the importance of this topic. Um, we all know that our nurses um, get supported in a number of different ways. Um, two areas which we as a healthcare system are heavily focused on is the ability to recruit and retain our nurses. Um, and the other area that I think we all appreciate is that they are under immense pressure. Um, and, and then when you throw on top of that, uh, some of the difficulties and challenges they have in, in dealing with patients that have behavioral issues, both from a psychiatric standpoint, but also from a clinical standpoint. And they continue day in and day out, um, provide compassionate and, and caring support for our patients. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. So the, the best we can do is not only acknowledge them, but also to focus on those areas where we can uh, make their lives a little bit more easier in terms of the day-to-day -day care. Um, clearly, recruitment and retention is a big area. Um, 
you know, throughout uh, the pandemic, I think we all appreciate the entire healthcare industry has come under a lot of stress. Um, and that stress translates directly into our workforce. Our nurses, as I mentioned, um, work very hard and to the extent that we can support them, express how valuable they are to the system, the greater likelihood that we can retain them um, from all levels of, of leadership, including the board. And I think they, they feel it and they know that. Um, so to bring attention to this item is important. I, I can also share with you, um, if you look at our numbers from an industry standpoint, you know, we're faring pretty well uh, in terms of retention. Uh, we can do a lot better in terms of recruitment. We know that, we acknowledge that. And I think uh, we have taken steps to, to do that along with the Employment Service Agency. Um, so we acknowledge that there are areas in room for improvement. Uh, the other thing is that given the COVID situation, we know that many of our patients present with behavioral issues. Uh, the risk is greater. Um, but if you look at our numbers, we've been able to maintain you know, a steady number of incidents. The problem is that any one incident is too many. Uh, and so our ability to work together with labor, um, with our labor partners, with our nurses to develop programs and initiatives is really where the focus should be and has been. Uh, so with that being said, I know John Mills is on the line with me. Yep. Um, uh, Joe Sproul would join in a second. He's but we're here and available to answer any questions regarding our report. Thank you, Jill and John, both good to see you. Um, why don't we go with public speakers first and then we'll go to Vice President Ellenberg and um, we'll go from there. Nancy. Our next speaker is RNPA. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. RNPA, you are unmuted. You can begin. Please go ahead and speak. That is our only speaker. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Model Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, we are at a disadvantage here when we're given one minute to address such a huge topic that our nurses work so hard for. Um, but all we can say is just looking at this report, um, the question that we want to ask the Board of Supervisors is, if all this report that you're looking at right now are all true, mm. why are the nurses complaining? So that takes me to so much of the report that I cannot address in one minute, unfortunately. But what we're saying is the nursing union and the nurses identify two major problems for them. All we ask the board of supervisors help us resolve these issues. Violence at the workplace has risen up tremendously. These data are not accurate. Our nurses are so understaffed. They are so understaffed, they don't even have time to report. And I'm seeing here where it says crisis, post-crisis report. We don't even have the opportunity when we have incidents to have a, a report or to talk about it. That has never happened. So. Thank you. Next speaker. That concludes our public comment. I show, oh, there, okay. That one just went away, thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you were first and Supervisor Chavez. Thanks. Um, I, I do appreciate that. I, and um, hearing from, from RNPA and from the administrative administration's report, I have just a few questions and then some requests uh, to make. I, I do understand that there's a likelihood that assaults um, on, on nurses in particular are underreported for myriad of myriad reasons. Um, I've been told that it's common knowledge to anticipate being assaulted uh, by an aggravated patient, um, that that's just part of a nurse's job, and that that contributes to underreporting, as well as a sense of discouragement regarding the likelihood of any follow-up to the reporting. And I'd really like to see um, how, what, what I, I'll say we, but I really mean the hospital administration in partnership with the nurses, create a safe and encouraging place for 
staff to report assaults as, as it's really critical for us to have that data. Um, with respect to gathering accurate data of instances of workplace violence, um, I'm not sure whether to direct this to Paul or, or Jill or someone else. Do you have a sense of how often assaults may be happening that aren't reported? And what are specific uh, steps that are being taken to encourage reporting? Thank you, Paul. Sure, and Jill can uh, add on to this. But, yeah. you know, I, I think, let me, let me start off by expressing to the board in, in response to this question that I think industry-wide, there are challenges with hospitals working with their staff and reporting. So even if you look at our statistics, and I would also agree that um, there are situations that aren't reported that should be reported. And I think the same would be true for other healthcare facilities. And we know that in speaking to our association and our counterparts. So industry-wide and specifically our Valley, you know, we want to encourage reporting of all levels and types of incidents. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, typically you would see if, if we've been successful in encouraging staff report, you start to see a trend of numbers and the, uh, the volume going up. And that can be attributed to, to two things. One is that there's now staff that are reporting. And number two, uh, that, you know, it, it continues to be a challenge for the system to address. Um, so, you know, what we try to do is uh, through the, the leadership and through communication with staff, a uh, reinforced importance of this, and not only for their safety so that we can help manage the situation uh, going forward, but also for their, their peers. Um, I think RNPA um, is right in the sense that we have to work together and to your common supervisor to encourage this type of activity. Um, and it's really uh, coming down to our ability to build trust and communi direct communication around these issues with our staff. Right. Thanks for that. Well, what is the, um, I have a, a several more questions. What is the follow up um, once a report is made? Um, obviously, we're collecting the data in whatever cases are appropriate, we're reporting it to OSHA. But what what is the feedback loop as far as the um, reporter is concerned? If the, the individual reports to the situation and there's a process for which they report, uh -huh. um, the expectation is the quality department follows up, but more specifically works with the department manager to ensure that the employee has received the appropriate support that they need. Um, at the time of the incident, the expectation is that the manager, uh, you know, if there's an injury involved, uh, immediately provide support. Um, also let the employee know what resources are available to them. Uh, and that's specific to the employee. Um, what we also try to do is have a debrief uh, given the, the level of it and type of incident that occurs. Uh, and, and that debrief involves staff that were present uh, that and or responded to the situation to ensure that we understand the, the entire situation. Typically in healthcare, we call that a root cause analysis. So from a system standpoint, what could have we done differently or better relative to uh, the incident itself? Uh, so we, we learn from the debriefs uh, from a system standpoint. We also are given the opportunity to interact with staff to ensure that, you know, that, the, that their concerns are being heard and listened to. And are, are those debriefs being conducted um, in with regard to every single incident? Are they, I'm looking for a gap between the policy, which sounds like a very good one, and the um, on the ground implementation. So, I mean, and Jill, can you speak to this? But there are two parts to this. So, an inpatient unit, depending on the severity or the level of the incident, the manager can institute a briefing and work with leadership and the staff to, to uh, conduct that debriefing, if you will, uh, bring EAP and bring any other support uh, stakeholders, if you will, into the process. Uh, in EAP and BAP, the expectation is that they debrief on a regular basis, on a per incident basis, uh, given the level and severities of many of the incidents that include, are included in BAP and EPS. Um, this was brought up by RNPA in the last meeting, I understand. 
Um, and that's something that uh, we need to follow up on because it needs to be consistently done uh, in support of our staff. Thank you. And Jill, can you add? Sure. So as far as the inpatient, um, and as Paul mentioned, depending on the severity, um, we, we do have an inpatient de debriefing team um, that whether it is an assault or um, a behavioral verbal assault or, you know, maybe a tragic death, we have a team of not, I mean, just of death of a patient or a traumatic code. We have a team that does go and they set up do, do several debriefings to catch all the staff. So that's to deal with the emotional, you know, well-being of the staff. That's usually at the request of the team. Um, but then we also, as Paul said, quality and risk also do a follow-up and work with the manager because they have to investigate what happened. Um, and, you know, I know we've had the sheriff um, meet with, um, with certain individuals that have had concerns with leadership also to help answer questions and what the process is. And um, I just, I just wanna say, you know, we, we, I think we all have the same common goals and I absolutely want a partnership with our MPA and how we can decrease, because none of us want to, you know, our nurses, our doctors, none of us want to see anyone get hurt. I can tell you on a national level, this is a very topic of concern. Um, I'm also uh, still connected to the burn centers across the country. And it is like a major concern, um, really kind of bubbling up right now with this pandemic, but it was an issue prior to the pandemic. So I know we're all trying to do whatever we can to address this. Thanks for that, Jill. I have no doubt in my mind that everyone has the same goals. I'm just looking as we all talk about, you know, continuous improvement and iteration, and, and that's a, a theme in my own office, I have to say of how we can do better the things that, that we know we want to do. One suggestion I, I'd like to make is um, perhaps creating a, um, a survey that is used as a follow-up um, when people report incidents of violence so that we can hear, did they get what they need? Did they have the debrief? Did they get whatever supports they needed? Were they satisfied with, with administration's response? And if not, what, what do we still need to be uh, doing to, to provide them with the support um, that, they, that, they, um, that they really do need? Um, uh, last question before I um, make just a couple of additional requests. Are the protective service officers and acute psychiatric services and hospital and clinic staff all trained together in how to respond to patients that have uh, that that may have assaulted staff in the past or or for whatever reason are at high risk for assault are those are those departments trained together well for psych we have done some joint training um it, that hasn't happened in the inpatient setting um, so there may, may absolutely be an opportunity there um but we have we have done it with the psych services um because, oh sorry I was, I, and they were the trainings were virtual during the pandemic, but I just wanted to note that they have gone back into um, live person trainings. That's good to hear. And, and I'm fully aware that I'm an outsider offering two or three cents um, we're worth of opinions here. Um, but thinking also that, that communication really is so key to ensuring success and safety. And, and if the staff and the protective service officers are expected to de-escalate or respond to a um, a patient who is who is behaving uh, violently together, then I I would think that receiving training together and having opportunities to discuss possible scenarios um, would really um, help build trust and also avoid communication or any kind of disharmony uh, between the two between the two departments. Um, I I do think that there is is tremendous potential for real integration and partnerships. And I think about this, you know, certainly not only with regard to our, nur our nurses, but with our bargaining partners and departments across uh, the county. But I wanna just finish with um, some, some more general comments about, uh, about the nurses. 
it is for sure not a secret that, that we are facing a national shortage of nurses. That's one of the reasons that Supervisor Chavez and I introduced a referral addressing not only workforce development concerns, but workforce safety concerns. Um, and I'd like to ask that administration consider extra help and per diem nurses for the critical care training program prior to any nurses from outside the county so that we can help uh, retain our, our current nurses. And second, I just want to uh, revisit the issue of pandemic pay for part-time workers. We, we've all discussed that many of our part-time nurses worked full-time during the pandemic. We, we talked about this issue under the ARPA item at the last board meeting, but the board didn't provide any specific direction. And my goal is to, to ensure that the nurses and other identically situated county employees receive that full 2,500 pandemic pay bonus. So Dr. Smith, what is the appropriate path or, or James uh, for this board to discuss and potentially direct administration regarding nurses and any other part-time employees that had been asked to and did work full-time hours during COVID? Dr. Smith and James? We're scheduled to come back to the board in the second meeting in December to give a report back about uh, the extra help uh, strategy. And that would be a time period where the board could direct us differently or make uh, suggestions. So I would say that's the best time. Okay, thank you very much. Then I, I will wait for that and um, appreciate consideration of the two suggestions uh, that I directed to Paul and Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavins. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, so thank you um, for the report, and I want to make a few um, a few recommendations as well. I'm just sorry, I'm just looking for my notes real quick. I I want to be able to make a motion to receive the report with additional direction. Uh -huh. And um, I second it. Thank you. And and let me just share with that. Um, uh, it, that additional direction is. I want to, um, Supervisor Allenberg, I'm going to start both with the first with the hiring process and then with the public safety issues. So um, in December, what I would like to request is that we receive an off agenda report with the timeline for the engagement of the external uh, firms. The report should respond to the five year reserve. Um, idea and the original referral that was intended to ensure funds are set aside for uh, to address workplace safety. And second, I'd like to ask staff to report to the board during mid year with more information on the status of the engagement with the external firms and a thorough analysis of the vacancies within the hospital system, including turnover rates and retention. Third, because nurses retention is so critical to ensure we continue to offer the highest quality care. Um, and I appreciate the ideas you suggested. I'm therefore requesting the staff share a progress report during mid-year on the development of the retention program, such as the clinical ladder and critical care programs. Once a, an external firm has been chosen to support its work, this staff, um, I wanna make sure that the, uh, that the union, RNPA, is included uh, in discussions with ideas so that, uh, you know, to help with uh, recruitment. And then just two other things that I would like to add based on the, the discussion that I've heard today. Uh, one is that, um, that we need to address the presence <clears throat> of the public safety officers on site, um, both how many of them, how available they are and their training. Um, and then what I would like to ask um, that gets included is that we have a, a Harvey Rose audit the actual responses. Um, and the reason for this, the, and, but what I mean is the responses to workplace violence, both the reporting and the um, support services. And the reason for this is that I think part of what needs to be um, strengthened is the, the relationship between our staff um, and our management, particularly with the nurses. And I think having both the external firm and, the, and an outside auditor giving just you know, direct, clear, 
observations will help all of us um, right size the direction we're going. Um, and then I, I think the other thing I just wanted to say, um, and really Dr. Smith, this is more to you and to Paul than to Jill. And part of the reason that, you know, I, I think that uh, Jill, your point about what the trends that are being seen across the country is such a critical acknowledgement that um, our environment, that there's just a high level of agitation in our environments. and. You know, we're seeing it in grocery stores, we're seeing it in restaurants, we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it in road rage. We're, it's just, we have to acknowledge that that's part of the environment that we're operating in. And then the second thing I, I think that's really critical to acknowledge is that when people don't feel well and they have to wait, there's this higher level of agitation. And then when people are waiting with a loved one, you add this other level of tension. And I think that um, we need to take a deeper dive into you know, wait times, which is actually part of staffing. And it's also part of, I know something that you're already doing as you're looking at, um, you know, new ways of procedures and always trying to make things run more smoothly. I recognize that. I, I just lift that up because um, I think we're in a new era. And I think absent really being able to address that in our workplaces, we're gonna have a different kind of retention problem. And again, something that's being seen all over the country, right? People opting to be out of the workforce instead of in it for, for those reasons of stress. So, um, so Susan, those would be my uh, recommended additions. Thank you, is that fine with the seconder? It is. Thank you, I'm just gonna uh, echo my support for whatever we can do to retain recruit and protect our nurses. That's uh, extremely important to me. I, I'm proud of the retention rate that we have compared to the national average. Paul, I appreciate your perspective that we can always do better. I think increasing the safety, we can always do better. And um, recruitment's a tough thing. You know, my daughter's 33, 15 years ago when she was 18, you know, she asked me, dad, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, 15 years ago, there was a nurse, a nursing shortage. I said, why don't you become a nurse? She didn't happen to become a nurse, but as far as I know, there's been a nursing shortage for 15 years oh, nationwide. And the more schools, you know, go Spartans, San Jose State, the more schools that can have classes to train people to get their, their nursing license, the better. And I hope that increases. I hope the universities recognize the shortage and to uh, have more and more classes because the patient's experience 90% of the time when they're at a hospital is with the nurse. And um, that's important. And I'm glad to see all the support that we all seem to have to try and make things better. But every single hospital wants to get more nurses and keep more nurses. So it's, it's a competitive world there. Before I call for a vote, Paul, your hand is up. Did you have one additional comment? If I may, Supervisor. Um, yes. So one of the things that's, I think, important to understand about the nursing industry and um, the number of individuals that are entering into nursing is that we have great success in recruiting new nurses. The number of job applications that we receive and the number of individual nurses that want to work for your healthcare system is, is very large. Um, our challenge and the challenge with most hospitals is that as Supervisor Chavez has indicated, many of the experienced nurses, skilled nurses are leaving the industry or simply they're retiring and it's their time to move on. Uh, what we've acknowledged as a system is that we're large enough to be, begin to develop and grow our own. Um, we've had conversations with RNPA and with uh, you know, John Mills and ESA about how we continue to develop programs to develop our nurses so that we can move them up to the next level um, so they can be intensive care nurses, burn nurses, uh, that they can work in our emergency departments. Um, and so we have to start to change our focus uh, to not only on recruitment, but really developing our own nurses internally within the organization. And that's something that we're focused on and we'll start to keep your, uh, we'll continue to keep your board informed upon our efforts. Thank you very much. Board members, um... I'm going to take this vote and Supervisor Ellenberg, I'm going to need you to take over the meeting. I've got a, uh, a family matter that I need to step away from the meeting for right now. Uh, 
Nancy, will you please uh, call for the question? Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Westerman? Yes, as well. Thank you. And my apologies to everybody. Vice President Ellenberg, you've got the helm. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, I believe that the next item is 23, no, 22, 22. Yes, that's correct. Apologies, I don't have the, I'm trying to organize the agenda in front of me with the item. Yes, and this was something I pulled off, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, if it's helpful, Fantastic. I'm happy to jump Take in. Take it from here. Thank Great. you so much. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to, um, first of all, I'm, I want to say a very special uh, and very sincere thank you to you all thinking creatively about what um, what next steps there are in the home ownership areas in particular. I am concerned about um, the, the approach relative to ownership and what I'm most concerned about is actually ownership of properties and then the ma maintenance of the um, the uh, affordability, even if you have folks uh, get enough money and out of a project they sell or a home they sell to move on to another location. Could you walk me through the, the benchmark that you put in and the why of that? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, if we can, we actually have a short presentation. Oh, for great. You. That'd be great. Um, Thank and, you. and I also wanted to take the time to introduce the board to Natalie Monk. She's our H uh, Housing and Community Development Division Manager. She's been with our office for about six months now um, and doing all of the work of Measure A um, and creatively thinking about new ways to accelerate development, come up with some homeownership ideas. So I will um, defer to her. She will provide the presentation. Thanks, Consuelo. Okay. Uh, Uh, on June 22nd, staff presented three ideas for pilot projects, which could increase affordable home ownership opportunities in the county, including cooperative housing focused on ELI households, new large scale affordable home ownership development, and infill development on small sites up to 20 homes. These project types are incorporated into the new proposed cooperative housing and home ownership project types in the proposed updates to our NOFA. Uh, we're proposing a new goal of 400 units associated with these two project types. We're also updating the guidelines to amend requirements for type two and three projects and to clarify and add requirements for community engagement and for the acquisition and rehab of existing housing. Uh, type two is currently for projects with an average affordability of 45% AMI with a 33% set aside for supportive housing. We're proposing to lower this to a 25% set aside to encourage more integrated development. Type three is currently for projects with a 25% set aside for individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities and their families. We're proposing to amend this to projects with at least 10 IDD units and a maximum of 25% IDD units. This is based on community feedback that the proposed change is expected to lead to an overall increase in IDD units distributed across the county. Uh, type four is a new proposed project type for developments with at least 20 rapid rehousing units. In this case, the county's financial contribution may be capped at $4 million. Uh, type five is a new proposed project type for cooperative housing projects. This chart shows example scenarios of how extremely low income, very low income, low and moderate income households could be served by this project type. Households would have an income of no more than $181,000. They would pay PCAC rent, which would be set at 30% of their income. Uh, and they would accept, expect to receive approximately $25,000 to $45,000 in equity if they moved out after 10 years. This type of cooperative housing offers very limited equity compared to home ownership but it can make a meaningful difference to households with the lowest incomes. 
Type 6 is a new proposed project type for affordable home ownership projects. This chart shows example scenarios of how very low income, low income, and moderate income households could be served by this project type. Households would have an income of less than $181,000. They would pay an affordable mortgage, which would be set at 30% of their income, and they would expect to receive roughly $75,000 to $230,000 in equity if they sold their home after 10 years. The administration is also requesting authorization to apply for $5 million in Cal Home Program funding from the state. These funds could be used to support a variety of home ownership opportunities within the county. And that, that concludes our report. I'm happy to take any questions. Supervisor Chavez, do you have follow-up questions before I look to the public for speakers or do you wanna wait? Oh, the public's fine. Thank you. And then I'll okay. go. Great, it looks like we have two speakers on this item. Let's, uh, let's do a minute each, please. Thank you. Our speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, uh, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, thank you for that uh, um, that report. It it looks like you're really um, trying to get creative and you're brainstorming like a lot of different ideas in order to to secure uh, residents of different incomes here in the city and the county but the if if we're not factoring in the generational consequences of of redlining when i looked at the when i looked at the how much equity a person would be able to get after 10 years i looked at that and there are homes right now in redlined areas that are getting that in one year and I think that we need to kind of like have some open conversations about that, about how these properties were able to acquire that kind of equity. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I'm really impressed with this item as well. Uh, thank you uh, for it. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's really important to me the ideas of future ideas of mixed income ideas uh, that uh, you're trying to uh, navigate and better understand at this time. Um, these this offers uh, incredible ideas towards um, a future of uh, I, I guess it's called uh, reparations. I mean that could be one way to look at it. Um, it is trying to define uh past generations how past generations can have a a certain place i suppose um it's good thinking it sounds like and and you're off you're in a really good direction that may be related to copa ideas as well uh good luck in, in further practices of these ideas thank you next speaker is victor vasquez please accept the unmute to begin speaking Good afternoon. I uh, want to say thank you for the presentation. My name is Victor Vasquez at Somos Mayfair. And we at Somos, we've been looking at all these different solutions. And we also believe that cooperative housing is an excellent way for us to think about how do we prevent um, future homelessness and how do we start thinking about both prevention and intervention. I'll continue to think about that, but actually take some action because um, the ideas of like potentially building new homes, but also acquiring properties already in the market to, to address our, our displacement crisis. It's, it's a better approach in our perspective because it addresses a current need, an urgent need that people are being displaced. That's only exasperated by the realities of COVID. And we hope to work with you and the staff to continue to make this a reality, not only within the county framework, but also with, uh, and with our city partners um, and hopefully this could happen in, in East San Jose and other areas impacted by displacement. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, coming back to my colleagues, are there any uh, further comments or questions? Supervisor Travis. Thank you. The reason that I um, asked this to be heard uh, were two issues. One, I think this is such a significant uh, program of the county. I think it's really important that these, these kinds of reports not necessarily go on consent. 
um, and also so everybody understands what we are saying yes to or no to. What I was hoping you could do is if you could talk just for a moment about the new pro project type four and um, and then just to remind me that the overall um, in each category, we still have funding. I mean, I'm sorry, we still have um, income restrictions, right? So we have that when I'm looking at the 800 million, that multifamily is for extremely low and very low income households. So the, the, that doesn't change. It's the, it's the mechanisms you're using for funding or the kind of product you're creating availability for. Is that accurate? That's correct, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And does that, so on the new project type, is that what you were referring to as being um, more along the lines of a cooperative? Uh, no, the project type four is essentially the same type of multifamily rental. Um, in short, we have a few projects across the county that don't meet the measure A requirements exactly um, the way we would like them to. Um, but there are other efforts in that respective city where when you think about, you know, the 10 projects in any one city, collectively, they meet the Measure A requirement. Um, but right now, they won't apply for Measure A funding or any of our county funding, um, with the exception of the IDB dollars, because um, they don't necessarily want to have a large number of supportive housing units in their, in their buildings. Um, and so this would provide an opportunity for us um, pre-measure A, this is more or less the way we were funding supportive housing across the county, small investment in our dollars, um, and it would yield anywhere between 20 and 30 units at a given site. The cooperative models, um, Supervisor well, Chavez. Just if, I'm sorry, Natalie, if I just could go back to this. So the source of this funding for, for the new project type is not measure A money then? It could be Supervisor Chavez. And sorry, Natalie and I are in the same room, room trying to use <laughs> one video. <laughs> um, it, it can be. So we've actually, um, all of our housing funds available throughout the county are in one NOFA. Uh, so we utilize our home dollars, CDBG dollars, Measure A. Um, in 2002, 2003, the board at the time approved an affordable housing fund. We get repayments from that. Um, funding source. And so we use a variety of funding sources, leverage home key dollars and anything really at our disposal to leverage increased production. And this would basically give a new opportunity to developers um, to rapidly um, increase the production of units that are reserved for rapid rehousing. So it can include measure A. So what I, I think that, um, let me just share with you all and my colleagues a concern that I have, which is that um, this, this is not, it's not clear from reading this report that that's the, that we're, that we're, um, how we're approaching this. And so I, and I don't, there's a, there is a section that talks about, you know, how we're using our, our NOFAs, but all the funding sources that are going into it. And here's the reason I'm, I'm really wanting to press on this. At some point, we're going to be running out of Measure A funds. And it's hard for me to understand from looking at this report what are we focused on relative to measure A? What goes on after measure A is, um, is used up? And does it still meet the higher goals that we have around permanent supportive housing for people who are homeless? And so, um, and I know, um, I know that you all have a lot of moving parts. Uh, so I recognize that this may seem very, very, oh no, it's so super automatic to you, but that that is not really what I understood from reviewing this. The second thing I just wanna say again for my colleagues is that um, there, there is an interest, at least I have an interest and have had one on the, on the for sale product of seeing how much of that money that gets invested can come back into that pool of money. And the reason that's so critical is that, um, you know, here it says we have um, 25 million programmed and 25 million left to program. Of that 25 million total amount programmed, we probably spent, what, less than 5 million so far? Yeah? Correct. So, and, and this to me is an opportunity to have an ongoing fund either for first time home buyer programming or being able to take what comes back from that and invest it into other parts of our program. And so I can't see that that thread through here. And if that's something else that's still being considered, I, I would wanna 
better understand that. Um, and, you know, and again, I think from a general perspective, I think the direction is fine and creative and I, I really appreciate you all digging in and thinking about it. Um, but I am really trying to better understand the, the you know, the, the, um, the evolution of, you know, where we are today and then where we're going to be going relative to what kinds of resources we're going to have over what period of time. So as an example, I don't know if you know Consuelo off the top of your head, and I, and I know the, the first time home buyer money we have to take out just for this one discussion is that when we will have depleted everything but the first time home buyer program and perhaps even the moderate income, I know we're a little bit more behind on that too, but do you have a sense of timing on when the 800 million will be committed? Yes, Supervisor, we're scheduled um, or planning to come back to the board in January with the next round of projects. And at that time, we are going to present to you all what we um, have left after the eighth round. Um, we are leveraging, our county is a recipient of no place like home dollars directly from the state. Uh, we just received notification that we're getting another $30 million. Congratulations. So Thank you. And, you know, we're doing everything we can to leverage other funding opportunities, for instance, the $5 million that we're um, is part of your recommended action today to bring in $5 million that we can leverage for homeownership opportunities. Um, so in January, we do propose to bring with bring to the board an update of everything related to Measure A from the seven objectives you all approve, the geographic distribution of measure A projects across the county and where the gaps are, and, re and a look at how much money is left to program from that 800 million. I'm sorry, left to allocate for projects. Thank you. And then the, the 20, the, um, yeah, I think, um, well, I think that, that um, you know, I, I, I won't, uh, for my colleagues with more questions, I'll get more time with you all. But I, I do, the reason I did wanna pull this is, I do think this is such an important program and I I am a little bit concerned that that I don't yet understand as we're using up the, the money that we have right now, um, whether or not we're gonna meet our permanent supportive housing goals as that was the primary um, driver of, of measure A. And so I, I just wanna better understand that. And then I think your points about being innovative and creative, and I've seen you do that with our um, CDGB money too. I've seen, you know, you kind of cobble it all together, but really better understanding longer term what those funding streams are and then what is our capacity going to be um, post measure A. Thank you. Would you I, like I would, to make a motion to uh, move this item forward? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. And is there a second? I'll second. Thank you very much. Are there any additional comments from other supervisors? If not, let's uh, do a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Still away. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to move now to item 23, which was held from November 2nd. This is to receive a report relating to the public release of audiovisual recordings of the incident involving Andrew Hogan and the status of county compliance with consent decrees involving the jail. Do we have a presentation on this item or are we going right to questions and comments? Uh, Supervisor, we're available for questions and comments. The report uh, indicates that we've provided the uh, videos and they're available on the county website. Supervisors Simidian and Lee, as this was your referral, do you wish to have a report made? I have uh, questions when the time is appropriate, uh, Madam Chair. Thank okay. Okay, then it sounds like you're good without a report. So let's go to the public first and see if there are public comments on this item and let's do a minute per commenter, please. First speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd, if you can repeat, please, specifically where the location is of that uh, film, I'd like to I'd like to review it, um, if I could, please. Uh, secondly, is that 
I am counting on you, uh, Supervisor Smidian. When you had given some comments about a couple of months ago with regard to the jails, you articulated, I mean, precisely that you at least understand the issues and you, uh, you, you articulated it perfectly in terms of what the issues are, what the county's accountability is, and what it is that we need to see from you. I mean, because I've seen what, what happened with Andrew, that's, that's common practice. I've seen that for decades. It's just that this one was caught on film and he really, really hurt himself and injured himself. But there's countless incidences that have never been reported that are at that level of severity. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I think uh, this was an item that was uh, on your agendas a few uh, weeks or months ago. Now, um, it was the first time that I, I think I tried to mention the ideas that uh, there, there needs to be an important, uh, robust and healthy new uh, exploration, I think, into, into the ideas of uh, open and accountable practices with uh, biometric uh, camera technology. I know you have the policies in place uh, for that work. I think it's a time to review those good practices and, and bring them out and, and what we can develop for ourselves and our future uh, community practices, uh, it can be a lot of help for ourselves and make a language understandable how to talk about subject matter um, for ourselves um, uh, and our future uh, that uh, we are entering into. And so thanks for your time uh, to hear myself on this item. That concludes public comment. Thank you so much. I'll go to Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. Let me uh, ask first, uh, following up on the request from one of the speakers, if the county council or someone from uh, the county council's office could describe again for folks where they can view the relevant video that has now been made public. It is available at jailreforms.sccgov.org. That's jailreforms.sccgov.org. There's a direct link uh, in the ledge file, which is available online. Thank you. And uh, let me also ask, uh, Madam Chair, do we know if Mr. Janako from the OIR group who serves as our Office of Cray? Ah, there he is yes, available. Here. Thank you. Um, well, let me just say, um, I think the video is as gut-wrenching today, a year and a half later, as it was when members of the board first had the opportunity to review it. I think it is important that it be publicly available in part so there can be no denial of just what kind of conduct took place that left one of our inmates brain damaged for the rest of his life and cost $10 million in settlement fees. Um, and uh, I would encourage members of the public with a caution uh, that it really is disturbing video, that if they uh, want to get some sense of the nature of the problem here, uh, num videos number 24 through 30 are perhaps most relevant uh, to the discussion that I'm hoping to uh, begin uh, again right now. Let me ask the county council's office um, a question about the sharing of these videos with relevant agencies uh, at our uh, first meeting on this topic back in mid-August, I believe, uh, the board took action to share information, including these videos with um, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, the State Attorney General's Office, the Santa Clara County Civil Grand Jury, and the state's Fair Political Practices Commission, also known as the FPPC. Is it has that has that information been shared yet, uh, Mr. Williams, or is that still a work in progress? And if so, uh, do you have a rough timeline on uh, when that information will be shared, including uh, this video? That information has not been shared yet. We were waiting to, uh, of course, have the videos and everything else done so we could send 
uh, one packet with everything together. Now that this item has been done, we'll be putting that together. Uh, I don't have a specific timeline, uh, but uh, probably the next uh, next few weeks, we should be able to get those packets together and sent out and we will uh, copy the board uh, on those packets. Thank you. Turning to Mr. Janako, if I may, through the chair from the um, OIR group who serves as our Office of Correction Law Enforcement Monitoring Entity. Uh, Mr. Janako, um, as I have indicated previously at these board meetings, um, given the fact that we have uh, someone who was in the care of our, of our jails, brain damaged for the rest of his life and a $10 million settlement, it, it was not surprising to me that an internal affairs investigation was opened. It was um, quite surprising to me uh, a year and a half ago to learn that that investigation was shut down uh, by someone uh, in the sheriff's department. And so I had asked uh, you and others have asked as well, um, who shut down the internal affairs investigation and why? And um, because you had characterized that in your report of September the 14th this year as highly uh, unusual. And I'm looking back at that report and looking at the language of your report, it says, and I'm going to read uh, verbatim here just to make sure I get it right. Uh, the sheriff, through her attorney, has expressly declined to provide us any information relating to the internal affairs investigation that her agency appears to have initiated and then deactivated. Without this information, we cannot answer this board's question about whether any meaningful internal affairs investigation was conducted and or the appropriate disciplinary action taken. Accordingly, we plan to use our subpoena authority granted by this board to compel the sheriff to provide the critical information. And then um, later on in the same report of September 2021, you indicate that um, based on available information, we believe, as did the sheriff's office initially, that a formal internal affairs investigation was necessary. Um, moreover, the heretofore unexplained closure of the sheriff's office administrative case is highly irregular and problematic. Uh, and You further indicate the internal affairs investigation appears to have been abruptly halted before the investigation could be completed or any findings made. Once an internal affairs investigation is initiated, it should be the extraordinary circumstance that would cause it to be closed without a finding. And Because the sheriff's office has refused to provide OCLEM with any documents relating to the internal affairs case or access to internal affairs leadership, we have no ability to independently evaluate the rationale for the sheriff's office closure of the case. And again, it mentions, uh, we therefore intend to exercise our subpoena authority as needed to carry out our responsibilities. And there is a footnote at page 25 that specifically talks about the political environment swirling around the case and the closure of the internal affairs investigation. So my question for you today is, where are you in that process of exercising subpoena power or has the information regarding who shut it down and why with respect to the internal affairs investigation been shared with you uh, without subpoena? Where are we in that process, sir? Uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Simidian, you read a report that I authored in the middle of September. All of uh, what you read is uh, still accurate as of today. Um, we have not been provided any information uh, relating to uh, the shutdown of the internal affairs investigation voluntarily by the sheriff's office or the sheriff. 
Um, so we are still at a standstill with regard to accessing that information voluntarily. As we indicated in our memo, uh, we intend to issue a subpoena uh, for the internal affairs information and for access to internal affairs personnel as well. And um, I've been working with county council on this. This is the first time this office would be issuing the subpoena. There were some details, but my understanding is that the issuance of that subpoena is um, imminent. All right. So by imminent, we mean within a matter of days or a couple of weeks at most? I hope so, sir. I um, have been uh, just received a um, communication this morning from County Council, and I uh, wouldn't, I would say it's going to be days more than weeks for sure. Let me turn to the County Council, if I may, through the chair and ask uh, Mr. Williams if he can provide us any more clarity or not yet at this point. That's consistent with my understanding. Day, days, not weeks. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful to know. Um, and Mr. Williams and Mr. Janako, uh, I, I'm looking at this footnote 29 on page 25 of the September report, and I'm going to read it verbatim again, Madam Chair, because it I think makes the case for why it is so important that the public have. Uh, an explanation as to what happened or didn't in connection with the internal affairs investigation that was commenced but then shut down. Uh, this is from Oakland's report of September 14th, 2021. It says publicly available information suggests that the investigation may have been irregular in other ways that merit attention. Public sources indicate that one of the supervising officers involved in the incident was a leader of the Correctional Peace Officers Association, which provided significant support for the sheriff's reelection. Public sources also indicate that the sheriff promoted that officer soon after the election and just a few months after the incident involving Mr. Hogan. These facts taken together with the unexplained closure of the internal affairs investigation certainly raise the question of whether the officer's position in the union and its support for the sheriff's political campaign played a role in the decision to deactivate the internal affairs investigation. But those concerns cannot be definitively assessed without OCLEM obtaining the requested information and access to Sheriff Supervisory internal affairs personnel. So Mr. Williams and Mr. Janako, I just want to exhort you again to pursue the subpoena if that is the only means by which uh, the county and the public can have a uh, fuller understanding of who shut down the internal affairs investigation and why, particularly given the political uh, context that has been identified by the folks at OCLAM. The relevance uh, of all this, of course, to the tapes is that the tapes show just horrific uh, the incident was why the county felt it should settle for $10 million, the highest amount in the history of such cases in our county, and, and why we need uh, to know what happened to the IA investigation, why there was not a completed internal affairs investigation, uh, and some measure of accountability in this instance. I just want to close, Madam Chair uh, and colleagues, by saying I think it is important not to paint with too broad a brush, as I have said before. Uh, there were individuals involved in this tragedy uh, who were confronted with very difficult circumstances and who comported themselves uh, actually quite, uh, quite well under very, very difficult circumstances. I wanna acknowledge that. I think that is the appropriate and respectful thing to do. I also wanna make plain that I'm trying to get an understanding of individual behavior. And so when I say don't paint with too broad a brush, that means Let's not uh, uh, suggest that any larger group of individuals or organization is accountable uh, in uh, cases where they may not be accountable. But again, until and unless we have clarity about why the internal affairs investigation was shut down, uh, we will not have answers to any of those questions. And uh, even a brief view of these videos I should compel us to demand answers and accountability. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. That's all I have today. 
Thank you very much. I have a couple of brief comments, but want to first look to supervisors Chavez and Lee to see if there's anything that you would like to ask or add. No, thank you. Okay. Um, None for me. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I realize that we have, have a lot to cover today, um, but I do want to make just two two comments. Um, the conversation that I've just been listening to um, really re relates as well to my referral with Supervisor Lee that sought to bring to the public information about use of force incidents and also just um, makes me think again about the importance of naming a chief of corrections as uh, Supervisor Chavez mentioned earlier and shifting internal affairs investigation to the chief's jurisdiction so that the board can have clearer access to that information. Is that something Michael or, or Dr. Smith can speak briefly to? Well, I um, maybe I can speak to that. Yeah, maybe I can speak to that. Um, Please. The question has to do with who's the appointing authority for the relevant uh, personnel. And so if we're talking about peace officers or correctional deputies, that is the sheriff. And so the appointment or not of the chief of correction won't change the uh, that function, but it depends on you know how how positions are staffed and structured. So, for example, there used to be uh, correctional staff that reported to the chief of correction instead of the sheriff, and they didn't have the same uh, status uh, under state law. But um, those folks would, for example, then report to the chief of correction and be subject to uh, IA by the chief of correction. So if this board desired to initiate that process, what would be the appropriate pathway? Uh, well, we've brought forward an item uh, several times uh, on a, about an annual basis regarding the structure of the jails. And so the board would need to adopt an ordinance moving and transferring functions from the sheriff to the Department of Correction. Uh, and take the other kind of related steps. And we've outlined the various issues around that when we brought those items forward. That item will come again to the board uh, sometime this uh, upcoming spring. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, James. I didn't realize that, that it was an annual occurrence somehow. Um, just one more point um, that I wanna make today it's because it, it feels important to just put on the record some concerns I have about the way we approach these consent decree updates. The board has received regular updates through the years. I've slowly been moving toward a realization that we really need to, to rethink the fundamental premise of addressing the consent decree. It's interesting to me that the lawsuit, which was supposedly brought to protect the best interest, interests of the plaintiffs, mostly concludes that some harmful practices must continue just in a slightly less harmful manner rather than redirecting people from being made vulnerable to that harm entirely. And I want to just highlight um, one aspect of the report that states construct directs us to construct a new jail with 3% ADA capacity or if the county elects not to build a new jail, meet and confer with plaintiff's counsel about additional construction needs in the existing facilities to achieve ADA compliance. I just want to remind everyone that um, we are not required um, to create uh, to create a, a new jail. That is, that is one way of addressing the consent decree, but not the only option available to us. So that doesn't need a, a response or comment. Just wanted to put that on the record for today. And uh, Supervisor Sumidian, would you like to make a motion on this item? With uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Williams and his team at County Council and to Mr. Janaco for their, their work, uh, I would uh, move approval of the recommended action, which is simply to receive the report. And is there a second? Happy second. second. Thank you so much. Let's do a roll call vote, please. Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Still away. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So colleagues, let me ask um, for some input here. It is four minutes until two. The redistricting item number 13 cannot be held before 2 p.m., but doesn't necessarily need to be held at 2 p.m. So I'm offering the options of either continuing um, with our agenda and holding 13 for, for last. I see vigorous nods from Supervisor Lee or pausing our agenda, handling 13 uh, at 2 p.m. and then returning to the remainder. Otto just made his, his preference clear. Um, Supervisors Chavez and Smidian. I agree with, I believe I agree with Supervisor Lee's head nodding. Uh, I, I think um, uh, our board can make uh, our way with just four of us through the remaining other items. I do think we probably want all five members together if possible for the redistrict conversation. Fair enough. Supervisor Chavez, any objections to that? Agreed. All right, leading by democracy here. Uh, that brings us to items 69, 70, and 71, which Supervisor Chavez asked to hear concurrently um, after removing them from the consent calendar. Thank you. I wanted to just give Chief uh, Garnett an opportunity to walk us through a brief presentation so that everybody knows what we're doing here. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Sure, absolutely happy to do so. Um, good afternoon, board members. So today we're going to walk you through our draft juvenile justice realignment block grant annual plan that has um, had a lot of lot of input and we're super duper proud of it. Um, presenting today is Dr. Holly Child from our department, Grace Gonzalez from Behavioral Health. Um, Judge Lucero was on the line to answer any questions that people might have. A lot of my staff and I'm on here, more behavioral health staff are on here. Um, and with that, let's go to Holly. Uh, good afternoon, Vice President Ellenberg and members of the board. Um, as you know, my name is Holly Child and I'm the Director for Research and Development for the Probation Department. And I want to pause a moment and give my partner for today's presentation an opportunity to present herself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Grace Gonzalez and I am the Program Manager um, with Behavioral Health overseeing our secure youth treatment facility. Nice to meet you. And today our focus is to present an overview of the local juvenile justice realignment plan. Um, for those of you who are listening in today, you can find the full plan on page 1439 of the agenda packet. We're gonna do our best today to summarize and honor the work that was done at this plan. There's a lot of really great detailed information and we're gonna give you a high level view of today's plan. We'll also have um, reserved some time at the end for questions. So to give everybody on, on today's call some background, through Senate Bills 823 and 92, the legislator is closing the department, the Division of Juvenile Justice within the Department of Corrections. That means that those facilities that were available for youth um, in our county who went to long-term uh, facilities, um, they're no longer taking youth. So I wanna be just a little bit clarifying for the audience who's listening today is that the youth who are currently at DJJ are not coming back to the county. This is really impacting the youth who are newly committed as of July 1st, 2021. So we're only looking kind of forward in this program um, and we'll make sure we reiterate that a few times as we go through today's presentation. The other thing that's really wonderful about this legislation is really in line with a lot of the juvenile justice reform work that's been happening in the county, really thinking about natural supports, communities, families, this legislation, this idea of bringing these programs locally gives an opportunity to have our youth closer to home where they can have more connections with family and community and to really have supports that are built during their time with us so that when they do go home, um, back to their home communities, they have those connections in place and those relationships and trust to build. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is the plan. There is a plan that each county is required to submit to the Office of Youth and Community Restoration by January 1st of 2022. This plan will be updated annually and uh, um, presented to that, to that department um, May 1st of every year. The intent of the plan. So during the short time for implementation, it's important to know that this is kind of an initial plan and the plan will evolve as we work towards our goals and we learn more about the program through our youth, families and community partners. We've already made some modifications and adjustments 
hearing from some of the youth who are in the program um, currently. I know, for example, our chief was actually in the facility yesterday who talked with all the youth to get feedback. So we're definitely staying connected with the voices and ensuring that we're meeting everyone's needs. The program is developed in collaboration with behavioral health and in collaboration with other various stakeholders. Um, the, the unit will be staffed with both probation group counselors and behavioral health staff. We're anticipating about 15 to 30 youth per year at any given time within two units in the juvenile hall. Given the timing of the passage and the implementation of the Senate bills, the juvenile hall facility was the only facility that was available that was both secure and appropriately rated for the population being served. It's really important to note that the county doesn't own the ranch, um, that at the state owns the ranch, and we currently lease the ranch from the state. As part of uh, the California Local Youthful Offender Rehabilitation, it's a long word, a long title, Facility Construction Funding Program via Senate Bill 81. Um, the county was able to construct the ranch, which is considered a minimum security facility that supports youth who are committed under um, certain offenses. The probation department would need approval from the California Board of State and Community Corrections, also known as BSCC, if you hear the acronym, and SB 821 bondholders to adjust the intended use of the James Ranch to allow our county to use it as a secure youth treatment facility. So although probation and behavioral health are presenting today, the plan was developed by a wide array of community partners and stakeholders. Their voice, time, and commitment are truly valued and it couldn't have been done without this collaborative approach. So I wanna show you um, some of the stakeholders that we engaged during this time. We have had some really wonderful partnerships with some of our community-based community, community -based organizations who've actually gone to DJJ and talked with the youth who are currently in the program. As I said before, we've also been really speaking with the youth who are currently in the program, getting lifetime feedback. We've had an opportunity to speak with youth who had been at DJJ previously to incorporate their feedback. We also conducted various community forums. We had some that were open to the general public. We also made sure that we had forums that were conducted in Spanish and also focused for young adults who potentially would have shared life experience to provide feedback. These focus groups were, were in collaboration with the Behavioral Health Department. They were hosted by the MIG group and we had approximately 150 people participate. Additionally, um, at, in October, we had the Burns Institute and the National Center for Youth Law. They hosted a community engagement session via Zoom to discuss the draft plan with youth, community stakeholders, and advocates. And they provided those findings to the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council at the end of October. And that feedback was integrated into the plan. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the body that works with this. Under the legislation, we do have what's called the Juvenile Justice Realignment Subcommittee. And we have had a very uh, numerous meetings. Meetings of the subcommittee are public. The agendas can be accessed through the County of Santa Clara County meeting portal. All meetings are held via Zoom currently, and the meeting links are posted on the probation website, in addition to the county meeting portal. Additionally, the probation department, we have a webpage dedicated to the implementation of the new program where community members or other partners can also find information. Let's talk a little bit about the purpose of the program. So it's very different than what we're talking about with the ranch in terms of the, the youth who are being served. The intent of this particular program is to provide a therapeutic healing environment where youth can build and strengthen resilience and protective factors. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these youth and some of the challenges that they face in a little bit. It's important first though, to tell you what are the four program values that we are focused on during this work with the youth. These values were developed from feedback from youth via forums and also feedback from community partners and approved by the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council. And those program values are community, integrity, love, and respect. We try to bring those forward in all of our meetings. We try to lead with those in our discussions and we try to remember that those are the core values as we're working through this plan and implementing the program. The state provided a plan template and the counties are required to follow this template. There are eight sections to that plan. And today the presentation will be organized by those sections so that you can flow along if you have the actual plan printed out. Um, and so you'll see that that's the organization of today's presentation. 
The legislation requires each county to add a subcommittee to their juvenile justice coordinating council to oversee the plan related to the local SB 823 program. You'll see here on this slide, these are the people who are currently serving on the subcommittee. The subcommittee composition was defined by the legislation and the county was able to double the minimum required community members. And we're actually fortunate to have two youth who have volunteered to serve on the committee. They've actually been incredibly helpful and we're incredibly grateful for the contributions. They've actually provided some really meaningful information back to us. So let's talk about the target population of this program. We're really looking at youth who have very high complex needs who are 14 and older. These youth are found to be wards of the court based upon their most serious, the most recent serious offense. We call them 707B offenses. And on the next slide, I'm gonna go through some examples to explain what those offenses are. In order to be eligible for this program, the court must find that a less restrictive alternative is not appropriate for the youth and set a baseline and maximum term of commitment. Youth whose cases originate in juvenile court can remain in a juvenile facility until age 25 with limited exceptions. So something to keep in mind is the probation department can petition the juvenile court to transfer a youth who's age 19 and older to an adult facility. It's important to note that most of the youth adjudicated for 707B offenses in our county are currently committed to the county's William F. James branch also referred to as the James Ranch. And the intent of the plan for the new SB 823 program is to maintain that practice and only recommend commitments to the new program for youth who would have previously been recommended for commitment to DJJ. We really wanna ensure that we are not net widening and we are not putting youth in, in a higher level program than we need to. So let's talk about um, examples of 707B offenses. This is probably really helpful for our members of the community who are listening in today. So for reference, um, the, the, the offenses that you see on the slide are referred to in practice as 707B offenses. In a little bit, I'm gonna be presenting what are the offenses look like for youth who are currently at the DJJ program at the state so that you kind of have a general idea of the offenses that we'll be looking at for youth locally. So just for comparison, this is information that are on youth who've actually gone to DJJ, which is the state program. And what you'll see that between January 1st of 2015 and December 30th of 2020, 64 duplicated youth were placed at DJJ. Most of the youth are male and Latino. Only a, only a small percentage of them um, had previous ranch history and 13 of those who left the ranch actually left successfully. For 30 youth who exited DJJ during the time frame of this data, the average length of time was two years. And so you'll see, if you look at the timeline, you can see the number of youth who were committed to DJJ by year. And what's really interesting is during this time, um, we only had six girls who were committed to DJJ during this time frame. And during the same time period, there was an average of 10 girls committed to the ranch program and juvenile hall respectively. However, that doesn't negate the need for special programming for girls in our custody, and which will be discussed in the program section of the plan, along with the probation's partnership with Vera's Institute, their initiative to end girls incarceration, which has been very successful in our county and contributed to the low number of commitments in custodial settings. It's also really important to note that on average between 13 and 15% of youth in custodial settings are LGBTQ and or gender non-conforming and the program will continue the county's efforts to be sensitive and responsive to the needs of these youth. So this slide is to give you a, an example. These are the offenses of youth who are currently at DJ, DJJ, which is at the state facility. And of the 30 youth who are currently there, you'll see that 33% are there for offenses such as murder or attempted murder. Eight are there for carjacking, four are there for robbery, and then you'll see the rest are there for a variety of offenses. From this list, you can see that the offenses that we're dealing with are very um, significant in nature. And a lot of these youth have had multiple years of trauma and complex needs that need to be addressed. This is information that we gather from our risk, need, and responsivity assessment here within probation. And it's to really give you an idea of the challenges these youth are facing. You'll see that a lot of our youth have significant behavioral health needs. They struggle with pro-social relationships. There are family issues that need support. We also have youth that, some youth that have substance use issues that are connected to their, their offenses. We have some issues with school um, and caregiver supervision. 
And so our focus for the program funding and services is really focused on the most prominent needs that youth have. How do we offer them the coping skills and the resiliency that they need in order to be successful once they're released back into the home communities? For these reasons, our program is really being um, focused on our collaboration with behavioral health. They're such an essential part of success for these youth. And we're really gonna have a huge focus on family and caregiver connections. I'd like to now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Grace, who's really gonna share more about the program interventions and services. Thank you, Holly. So as previously mentioned, the purpose of the program is to provide a therapeutic trauma-informed environment. Many, if not all the youth currently in custody have had traumatic experiences. We are dedicated to providing care that is trauma-informed and embrace the core guiding principles, which include understanding trauma and stress, compassion and dependability, uh, safety and stability, collaboration and empowerment, cultural humility and equity, and resilience and recovery. By practicing the core principles and providing services with the healing perspective, we can promote a climate and culture of wellness cultivated for youth, family members, and staff. Next slide, please. Additionally, gender responsive and cultural services are offered to all youth. Listed on the slide are just some of the services we currently provide. The Young Women's Freedom Center and Girl Scouts are specific programming offered to our girls. The probation department has other enrichment program opportunities that continue to be developed in coordination with our uh, partners. Services will be provided in a culturally responsive manner to be developed in coordination um, that is a culturally responsive um, to the entire population demonstrating fair and equitable practices for participants with diverse identities, including gender, age, uh, religion, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. Next slide. There will be four educational and vocational pathways that are offered to youth. The county is working with multiple partners, um, San Jose City College, Foothill, De Anza, to name a few, to develop different opportunities. The four pathways are outlined here. And I just wanna point out that these pathways may be completed simultaneously depending on the youth needs and interest. Each youth will be supported through a partnership with the County Office of Education to develop an education plan that's inclusive of high school diploma and college or career pathways. For example, we have a youth who's about 50 credits shy from obtaining his high school diploma. He shared an interest in learning more about his culture and heritage. So our County Office of Education counselor assisted him with enrollment in a Mexican American history class through San Jose City College. The youth is ecstatic because not only is he learning about his heritage, but is also earning credits as he continues to work towards his high school diploma. Next slide. So there are several vocational uh, elective problem, uh, programs offered. Some programs offer certification within 12 months, such as culinary, uh, pro computer programming, pet grooming, and personal training. Other programs take more than a year to complete the certification process, which uh, include auto body or mechanic, barber program, and clean energy. Next slide. In addition to the vocation and educational services, youth are offered a wide array of uh, enrichment activities and supportive services. These programs will be available to all the youth in juvenile hall, um, specifically the secure youth treatment um, youth. And these activities were developed with feedback from the youth in juvenile hall on their interest, uh, feedback from stakeholder forums and research on evidence-based practices. Other enrichment program opportunities will be developed in coordination with our partners. Our current uh, Secure Track youth have begun the music production program and they're really enjoying it. Um, both youth and staff are excited about the programs and services that are underway. Next slide. Behavioral health management system. So this level system is based on the evidence-based practice, uh, positive behavioral interventions and supports, we call it PBIS. Um, it allows for youth to learn coping skills through positive uh, reinforcement. Through this system, youth are provided with a seamless transition into our secure track uh, facility. And the youth are given incentives and goal setting um, that are done at every level, regardless of the commitment time. A key component of this behavioral health management system is that it increases collaboration, goal setting between the youth and the staff using consistent progress reporting. 
and progression through the level system will require that each, each youth um, is actively engaged. Next slide. While we all agree that it's imperative that we assist the youth in rehabilitation and successfully reintegrating into the community, we must not forget the victims of the offenses. Um, victim or survivors are connected to an advocate that informs them of their rights, bridges them to different uh, system officials, and links them to services for ongoing emotional support. Also provide uh, restorative justice services such as victim awareness workshops, victim offender mediation, and healing circles. These offer opportunities and spaces that allow for healing for both the victim and the offender. Next slide. So existing enrichment programming and services are available through our, our MAC Center, our multi-agency assessment center um, that will also be accessible to our Secure Track youth. Uh, procurement for additional programs and services will occur as the gaps are being identified. Uh, but most likely in the fiscal year of 2023 and 24, RFBPs will be released. Um, however, in the meantime, off cycle procurements are possible to meet um, some more emergent needs. Next slide. So the juvenile justice realignment block grant funds will be used to augment behavioral health staff to support the operations of the facility. These include the program manager one, a clinician, rehabilitation counselor, and psychosocial occupational therapist. Um, we've obviously filled the program manager one position, but I'm also excited to announce we have filled the uh, rehab counselor position, and we're actively recruiting, recruiting for the uh, clinician and occupational therapist. Next slide. So the Behavioral Health Services Department will continue to conduct comprehensive screenings and assessments that include a behavioral risk assessment and integrated assessment, which includes both substance use and mental health. The assessments will include the youth needs, uh, strengths, trauma history, readiness for change, safety, and assessment for cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms. Part of the assessment process includes partnering with our team psychiatrists to determine any potential benefits of psychotropic medication. One of the practices that we're using is the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, uh, UCCI, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Interventions. This approach will teach youth strategies to manage risk factors in a way that is developmentally appropriate. This includes the implementation of groups that are co-facilitated by behavioral health and probation, um, and, probation um, and also include individual sessions with the group counselors. We're also utilizing Bruce Perry's uh, neurosequential model as part of the assessment and clinical care planning process. Not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Bruce Perry, but he just wrote a book called What Happened to You? He's done a lot of great work in this developmental neurobiological approach to clinical work. Our behavioral health staff have begun training on the neurosequential model. The assessment looks at uh, developmental risk, adversity and resiliency, uh, neurodevelopmental needs and strengths and provides treatment considerations uh, to guide clinical work through a trauma-informed lens. The neurosequential model considers brain development relational and cultural connections into the assessment process and supports intervention planning that's culturally sensitive and developmentally appropriate. Individual therapy continues to be provided using a psychodynamic and behavioral therapies and will include evidence-based practice models such as motivational interviewing, interpersonal psychotherapy, um, seven challenges, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and uh, CBT. The youth will continue to meet with their current behavioral health therapist to ensure a continuum of care. Additionally, family-based interventions using multidimensional family therapy will be provided by the therapist to support uh, strong family connections and relationships, as well as offer family or caregiver support. Young parent support will be an integral part of behavioral health services for youth and young adults as well. Sexual behavioral health treatment uh, sexual behavior treatment services will be delivered by a contracted provider. And lastly, our behavioral health clinicians will continue to provide substance use and mental health care based on screening and assessment. Next slide. So the youth and family engagement begins from the moment the youth is committed. Within the first 48 hours of commitment, um, the program manager, uh, myself, and the rehab counselor connect with the youth to provide overview of the program 
explain the child and family uh, team meeting process, obtain releases of information, identify uh, family or natural supports, explain the individualized rehabilitation plan or the IRP process, and discuss the transfer to the secure track unit. Within the first 72 hours, the entry, the re-entry support counselor meets with the youth to conduct vocational assessments and reviews the educational and vocational track opportunities. The assigned group counselor and supervising group counselor will also meet with the youth during this time period to provide an overview, uh, review unit expectations, and uh, brief orientation. I then contact the family and the supports that the youth have identified to introduce myself, uh, explain the process, explain the individual rehabilitation plan, and schedule the, the CFT or the child and family team meetings around their availability. Within one week of the commitment, the first CFT is held, and then by the 15th day, we have another CFT. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, the CFT team That's is great. Really pardon, pardon the interruption. I just want to get a time check. How many remaining slides do you have? Um, not that many. Uh, we have about maybe five or six, five if I'm not mistaken. We have five slides left. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so again, the CFT is created in support of the youth. The entire CFT process is youth-centered where the family and um, supports are asked to provide input. As a facilitator, I emphasize to the youth and family the importance of expressing their needs because they're a part, they're, they're the experts really of their lives. And although the professionals at the table have conducted their assessments based on their respective fields and have given their recommendations, ultimately the youth and family know exactly what they need. And it's because of this that the CFT is an imperative collaborative effort. This process ensures transparency and accountability. The youth, parent, and family voice and choice are assured throughout the entire process. Some of the feedback that we've already received from the youth and caregivers is that they're extremely grateful for the meetings as they've allowed an opportunity for them to receive information, ask questions, and partake in the development of their rehab plan. Parents have expressed a deep um, appreciation for the many opportunities offered to their son and the chance that they have been given to change their lives. So next I'll hand it over to Holly who will speak about the facility. Great, thank you. As part of Senate Bill 823, there was a, a small pocket of money that was set aside to award one-time grants to counties for the purpose of providing re resources for infrastructure-related needs and improvements to assist counties in the development of a local continuum of care. The probation department applied for and was awarded $356,000 to address the confinement of youth um, and what you'll see is this competitive grant is, is going to allow the county to soften the look and feel of the designated living environments within the juvenile hall to the extent feasible. None of the juvenile justice realignment block grants were earmarked for renovations in juvenile hall. Um, but what we are planning to do is really consider a trauma informed design. And so what you'll see on the slide are photos that represent some of the ideas and examples from the architectural design firm of what could be implemented in juvenile hall. All youth will have single occupancy rooms. There'll be an expanded lounge and relaxation area. They'll have their own classroom. There'll even be a room for specific behavioral health services with privacy, um, where it's a warm, safe, comfortable environment, a wellness room, um, having a visiting family room, and to do some modifications for the outdoor areas. What you'll see, it'll have a very dorm-like feel. Um, and we're also really excited. We've gotten some early feedback from youth um, who are currently there. And what you'll see is these are pictures currently from Juvenile Hall to give you an idea of the attempts to kind of repurpose Juvenile Hall. As you know, since we are, um, is currently the only facility available due to the bond situation, we are, have done some really um, great things with the particular space. And some of the feedback, early feedback we got from youth was more sense of autonomy, really, for example, having access to snacks and drinks when they're hungry and not waiting for certain times. So the staff in Juvenile Hall and, and Behavioral Health have, have created this little kitchenette where youth have open access to drinks and snacks. They're out of their, their rooms almost all day long, um, really interacting and, and being supported and integrated by staff inside the facility. One of the important things about this initiative is really collecting good information and being able to have it data-driven. 
to get not only that qualitative voice from youth, but also to track outcomes. What we're using for this particular project is the results-based accountability framework. So we're gonna be looking at how much was done, how well did we do it, and are the people that we serve better off? We will be collecting typical program information that you would, you would expect for us to collect regarding demographics, case information, looking at MFTs, CFTs, looking at assessment data, um, are youth meeting their goals? How are they progressing through program phases? Looking at dosage information regards to all the intervention programs. But in addition to the outcome measures required by the Welfare and Institutions Code, we're also committing to looking at information that will look at three key things. We wanna ensure there are no net widening impacts and commitments to the local program compared to the commitments to DJJ. We also wanna protect against any increase in adult court prosecutions of youth in the county. And finally, we wanna ensure that, any, that we, we monitor any racial and ethnic disparities to try to reduce the impact um, of youth of color compared to white youth. And we're very committed to the, those three data points and work closely with the JJC to present information when available. Specific outcomes. So this was actually a quote from one of our stakeholders, which I think is very important when we talk about outcomes, is that everyone is someone's child. And we all look at this again, we go back to our four pillars, um, four values that we talked about before. You'll see those reflected in the outcomes that the group has, has kind of committed to. The first one is youth have a sense of hope for their future and they feel valued strength in family and natural support relationships, improved housing safety and stability, reduction in new offenses, improvement in well-being and the reduction in trauma-related issues, improved school and meaningful and sustainable employment, and changes within system partners, holding ourselves accountable to see where we can do better and what's working. Next steps. Um, the probation department is here today to present to the Board of Supervisors so you have the needed information when making funding allocations and other related decision points. We will go back to the JJC subcommittee in November. The plan is due to OICR the 1st of January, 2022. And then after the plan is submitted, the probation department is committed to a collaborative inclusive process to work towards the development of a long-term plan and looking at various options for step-down models to a less restrictive facility or placement as appropriate for the youth in our care. And now we'll have an opportunity to answer any questions. And everybody, just Thank for you. the record, I'm, I'm back, um, but I'd like Super, uh, Vice President Ellenberg to please continue running the meeting as my present may, presence may be intermittent. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, President Wasserman, uh, thank you all so much for for the report. This this really is um, a dramatically new new direction for our county. I want to thank Chief Garnett and and her staff for the very comprehensive presentation, and and thank you, Chief, as well for continuing to center directly impacted kids and visiting with them to to solicit direct input. This is exactly, I think, the best the best approach we could we could ask for. And I know that we've been in this together since the governor signed SB 823 a little over a year ago. And just want to reiterate again that I'm very grateful for our partnership as I've been working on the DJJ realignment at the California State Association of Counties uh, as our board representative. So thank you for the report. I don't have questions today, but glad to turn to my colleagues. Supervisor Chavez. Um, I would just want to say thank you. I know we have a couple public speakers, but I, I just wanted to say very sincere thank you for the work. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? If not, we'll go to the public, please. First speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Sickle from the Horseshoe. Um, I spent from 79 to 85 um, in and out of juvenile hall. I, may, I never made it to uh, YA or, or to the uh, Boys Ranch. But I, I have to tell you that whoever, somebody was listening, you, 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 you're, you're getting it. And, and the way that you set it up, the, the very humane environment, to where the person doesn't feel like 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 they're being punished you know these are kids you know they're, they're they're coming in saddled with 
all of these kinds of issues that you know have have generational impacts and 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 to have that compounded in my generation by like there was something inherently wrong with us we didn't have the kinds of programs that you have outlined here and just i cannot thank uh whoever designed these programs enough for the humane approach that you took thank you next speaker is andrew please accept the unmute to begin speaking hi can you hear me yes Hi, my name is uh, Andrew Bigelow, uh, organizer at Silicon Valley Debug, uh, and work with families who have loved ones who go through the juvenile system. Um, uh, we are uh, participate and have been actively participating in the A23 subcommittee and the working groups. Um, uh, I know the board is not making a decision, but want to plant the seed that uh, you know, we, we're asking for the board to reject this plan and, and ask the subcommittee to come back with a temporary plan that does not involve juvenile hall. Uh, we acknowledge the time constraints because uh, DJJ stopped intake, um, but this subcommittee has been meeting for over six months, um, and there's been enough time to come up with a temporary immediate solution that did not involve juvenile hall, um, and here we are. Uh, the community has been very clear um, about uh, not wanting to use that facility um, and for that to not be the floor, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't seem to have... Um, have been incorporated into this plan. Next speaker is Ron Hansen. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon, supervisors. Um, I want to compliment uh, probation, uh, the community partners that have worked with uh, with the subcommittee, as well as the all the others in the juvenile justice uh, um, legal system, uh, the, the court, uh, the public defender's office, and the DA's office for putting together uh, a, what I believe to be a very strong program uh, that will serve the needs of the youth that uh, are committed there. And uh, that this is not the end, this is the beginning. And uh, I look forward to, um, to looking at this program again uh, as it matures. Thanks for, so much for your work. The next speaker is Sparky Harlan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO, Bill Wilson Center. As we had the conversation about not building the new jail, I think you all are gonna know that for almost 40 years, I've been trying to reduce population in juvenile hall, not increase it. And even though it might look nicer on the inside, it's still a jail. There's still four walls that kids cannot get out of. Kids are still suicidal when they're locked up in jail more than 24 hours. So I really beg you to consider more alternatives than just making juvenile hall, quote, trauma-informed and to look better. We need more community alternatives, including more residential alternatives. Please don't just accept more jail for our young people. Thank you. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Victor Vasquez at Somos Mayfair. Um, our families participated in some of these input sessions. It was clear from our perspective that young people should not be involved in any kind of jail or policing intervention at this point. We believe that racism and injustice and unjust policies create the conditions for incarceration. It leads to criminalized behavior when someone is hungry, poor, struggling, being displaced. You have feelings and those feelings could become self-blame or we are put in a position that we must um, take action by any means to, to survive. And so when that happens, solutions like, like jails, like involving the police are normalized and we end up suffering. Um, in our neighborhoods. So we believe that some of these elements are great. We should be working with the city and the count and you all to make sure that we have many youth centers, many interventions uh, for young people outside of the streets, no jails. Next speaker is Marty Estrada. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. I think the key word is less restrictive programming. That's according to the law, SBA 28, if you look at it, uh, it doesn't mean it has to be juvenile hall. Juvenile hall is not set up or meant to house youth long-term. 
Judge Lucero and her colleagues also supported through a letter that she does not support long-term housing at Juvenile Hall. We needed to come up with different solutions. What was presented to the state of California was just a placeholder. It was not set in stone. This is a working document. We got to we gotta find other resources, other places meant for kids instead of Juvenile Hall. And, and if you look at trauma-informed lands, Juvenile Hall is not the right placement for youth. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Alex. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So having worked with youth involved in both DFCS, so child welfare, and the juvenile justice system for almost four years, I feel like this is something where we have a truly amazing opportunity to completely redefine what juvenile justice can look like. In the short time getting to attend some of the um, meetings around this topic and working directly with families and community providers, well, it is heartening to see that we've added many more community stakeholders and families to these discussions. What I'm really seeing and hearing is we need to have an overbalance of community members versus professional stakeholders in determining what this could really look like. Um, really getting outside of the system to redefine what juvenile justice looks like from a community and, and family standpoint. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Walter Wilson. I'm um, a chair of the county CCLEM, but I'm speaking specifically for myself. And, you know, it's almost as though the people who created these great programs and did all this work to put together these, these far-reaching brand new ideas didn't listen to the community. And that's unfortunate because if they had, they wouldn't have not included Juvenile Hall, that facility in this process. And it's unfortunate because there's so much good that's come out of, that will come out of the work that they're talking about doing. But the deal is Juvenile Hall is not a place where we wanna put our children if you plan on having anything positive come out of it. Because the deal is a pig is still a pig. I don't care if you put lipstick on it. And that's the case here. We, we, we cannot have our children in that facility. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lori Valdez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Lori Valdez I'm with the Just for Josiah, and I'm calling to ask the Board of Supervisors to not um, think about doing another juvenile hall. Our children deserve better. Where we need trauma-informed is in our schools. Before they get there, our teachers need to know how to recognize trauma so they're not funneling these kids to the school-to-prison pipeline. We have to get them when it first starts and we have to do the interventions before it gets to that point. When it gets to that point, you're just adding more trauma to these children because they don't deserve to be treated like animals locked up in cages. They're children, they're somebody's children and the people who are there supposed to be watching them, they're abusing the children, forcing them to do things, come out of their rooms, that if a parent was to do that, it would be child abuse. But because the state says it's okay, it's not child abuse, but it is. So please think about the children before they go there. Don't lock them up. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Are there um, further additional comments from supervisors? And if not, um, I will turn to Supervisor Chavez who pulled this off of consent for any final comments and or a motion. Um, I, I move that we receive all three reports with our gratitude to the staff. And, you know, I, I um, so anyway, that'd be a motion and then I'll make a quick comment. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And my only quick comment is that um, I think that, you know, we're going to be, I, I think it's going to be really critical that we get an opportunity to um, have success in this environment and move creatively from here. Um, I want to thank um, you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for really, you know, taking, taking a look at how this can be um, something that is really reflective of our community values. And, you know, I, I did hear all the speakers. I, I just want to reinforce that these are um, young people who've committed 
relatively serious crimes. And so I think that starting where we're starting is actually a very, very good place. So thank you. I will just then add to that before I, I call a vote. Um, I don't think any of us want to see children confined um, in, in these very prescriptive ways. One of the things that I am extraordinarily concerned about is not having uh, children sentenced to adult prison. And a, a very substantial risk exists that if we do not have a local secure track facility that meets the expectations, frankly, of the district attorney in the court, then they are, I, I can't say likely, I won't speak for them, but, but their conclusion may be then to send the kids to adult prison, which is an absolutely unacceptable um, outcome in my view. So I think what we're trying to do here is really um, mitigate harm to the greatest extent possible. I'll note that we need to have the plan submitted by January, but that it can be reviewed and amended uh, at any time. So I appreciate the work of staff. I appreciate um, my colleagues and all of the, the members of the public who, who weighed in today. You're, you're not wrong uh, in my view, in the supervisor's view. So um, with that, let's uh, do a roll call, please. I'd like to confirm that the motion is to receive the report from the probation department to approve the request for the appropriation modification and to ratify the attestation form for the County of Santa Clara signed by the County Executive? Yes. Great, thank you. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more items uh, to go through before we begin the, the conversation around item 13, which is redistricting. Uh, these two items have been removed by consent by Supervisor Chavez. So let me turn to you for item uh, 73, which is adoption of an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors uh, amending chapter nine of division B11 of title B of the County of Santa Clara Ordinance Code Relating to Garbage and Refuse. And Vice President Ellenberg, if you don't mind, I'd like to re get, retain, get back. You got it. Take the gavel, sir. My chairmanship for now, and um, I appreciate you standing, uh, standing by. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. This was actually pulled by Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, if staff is available, I pulled these items because I have three questions slash concerns that I want to raise publicly. Um, as I understand it, essentially staff has said, uh, we have some new legislation from the state regarding um, waste management, garbage, uh, and uh, we need to have ordinances in place to conform to that state uh, mandate uh, let me just ask uh, who's the right person to address my questions to and also to confirm that my understanding is correct about why we're uh, being asked to head down this path. Uh, Joe Center, Joe? head of the uh, SEPA is the right person to ask. Welcome, Joe. Good uh, afternoon, supervisors. Hi. I'm here uh, to ask questions. We also have a uh, county council here uh, for to answer some of the legal. Thanks, Ms. Um, my. I've got three three concerns. The first is, it sounds like we are now going to have people rummaging through uh, other people's garbage, which raises some privacy concerns. It also um, it gave me some comfort to know that there was a plan to provide notice to customers of uh, some changes in the requirements for customers. But candidly, we've struggled with notice in the past as a county and only to discover that what staff thought was adequate notice um, wasn't sufficient to really get the word out. People still felt blindsided, even though we had met the technical requirements of providing notice. And the third piece is, I understand that there's no expectation of a cost increase, but if we're asking our waste haulers to do something differently or new than they've done in the past, 
My recollection is that there's a provision in their contract that allows them to say we're entitled to more money. And I'm remembering that when uh, we had a change in uh, recycling uh, practices as a result of change behavior by China, all of a sudden our board had uh, a higher rate in front of us. So my first question is privacy related. Who's going to be rummaging through whose who's garbage? Could we just get that part out there straight? Yeah, certainly. Um, so this is uh, Joe Zintek with the Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency. The state law uh, requires that uh, the local jurisdiction, and for this is pertaining to unincorporated county, which is about 16,000 residential customers and about 500 businesses county th throughout unincorporated all districts. Uh, the state law requires um, that uh, we provide uh, services for organic waste collection, which is basically uh, things that rot food paper to get that organic waste out of the landfill uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas methane. Um, the, it requires a monitoring program. All local governments have to have a monitoring program. In this case, um, uh, the standard monitoring program is for uh, the local government to um, review 10% of the customers every year to make sure that they're uh, getting the organic material out of their garbage cart and putting it in one of their other two carts they have uh, that would uh, recycle the material. Um, so we're required to do 10% of the customers in uh, uh, calendar year 2022. And I, as you mentioned, um, for uh, this would largely be lid flipping of the garbage cart out after it is set out for collection. It would be done um, at least the first year by county staff in SEPA. The, uh, if um, we're able to get 90% of residential and commercial customers with organic waste service, we can uh, request the state to stop doing the more um, uh, customer by customer assessment in 2023. And we're well underway to be able to do that already. Uh, um, all residential customers have access to organic waste collection already now. They've had it since the beginning of these contracts. So um, that's already in place. So that's 100% of residential. And then we're well underway of getting the commercial customers subscribed. So after 2022, we'll ask the state to go to a more route level monitoring system, which does not require us to go customer by customer to to flip garbage lids and look inside and see if they have material in there. Yes. Let me just uh, ask you to pause there so I can uh, drill down on that. Uh, so if we have to monitor, uh, which I think is um, another word for look inside somebody's garbage fail, yes? Yes. Uh, then 10% uh, of 16,000 is 1,600 uh, residences. So does that mean that county staff will be uh, forgive my phrase, poking around inside 1,600 garbage cans and 1,600 residences, looking to see whether or not the residents have properly complied with the uh, organic uh, waste uh, directive? Yes, we're not going to be moving the stuff in the cart. We're going to be opening it up and looking what it looks like on the top and then using that for education. And I, after the first year, we're well underway to go to the less invasive um, uh, component of the law where we can do it on a more route basis and don't have to go house by house. But the first year, there's no out for that house by house look. So, so if somebody went to, if one of our team uh, from uh, the county, from uh, SEPA went to a residence and found organic waste in the garbage can. Uh, I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, coffee grounds and eggshells, for example, are organic waste, yes? Yes. Okay, and if they're in the garbage can, uh, what happens to the offending homeowner? We would just leave them a note saying that, uh, reminding them of the law and asking them to put the material in either the recycling cart or the yard waste cart. Okay, and what happens if week after week they decline and they continue to throw out their uh, organic waste in their garbage can? We would just, all we're doing is education and behavioral change. So we do not need to enforce 
that part of the law, but we're requiring we're required to do the monitoring and to do the education. And fortunately, every city's in the same boat, so we'll be sharing a lot of material and and hopefully doing a being able to standardize some of that messaging across okay. the county and the. So I know as much as you encourage people to shred their documents and exercise care, you know, I think most people have the expectation that once they throw something in the garbage, nobody's going to be rummaging around through it and looking at it. Um, do we have any privacy directive directives for your staff that say, hey, while you're there reading other people's mail, for example, or uh, financial documents is uh, not allowed, prohibited? Anything we can or are do already doing to make sure yeah. that people are privacy sensitive? Certainly. I mean, already uh, most people recycle, use the put, separate their paper and put it in the um, the recycling cart that they already have. And the way people typically protect their private is either they they tear the uh, the paper uh, to get rid of their address or confidential information, or they um, uh, mark. The material out so uh, that's how people typically do that that have been recycling paper in the recycling cart our staff uh, will be instructed not to read that thing but all they're really doing is opening the top of the cart and seeing what they see from the top so they won't be touching the material they won't be reading the material they'll just uh, be doing that quick look thank you i'll move on to the next uh, piece of my question which is my understanding is that there's a plan to send out, is it one notice or is it more than that? Yeah, we've already been notifying customers of the change. For residential customers, there, there is no service change. So they, it's the three carts, that system is already compliant with the new state law. Um, uh, so they they won't be sorting the material differently uh, from from for uh, going forward, except for the issue of the organic waste that they're putting in their garbage cart needs to either go in the recycling cart or the yard waste cart. So there's no service change for them. So it's really just that very um, uh, specific behavior change of put it in the yard waste cart or the recycling cart if it's clean paper. I can just tell you that uh, if I were to glance out a front window and I don't think I'm unique or unusual in this regard uh, and suddenly saw people rummaging through my uh, garbage uh, or inspecting my garbage uh, from the government, I'd sort of say, what on earth is going on? Uh, and with 1600 folks, I think you're gonna have some folks who uh, think what on earth is going on. So um, I'll come back to that in a moment, Mr. Mr. Chair. And then um, what is what, if anything, uh, are the obligations on the waste haulers themselves? Uh, or are there none really in this instance? There's none in this instance. They provide all the compliance services are already in their base contract. So they're, there's, they're not providing any additional services. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chair. I um, I have answers to the questions I wanted to ask. Thank you, Ms. Intech. I'm going to abstain on today's items. I have concerns about privacy implications, notwithstanding the fact that this is a state mandate. Uh, I do want to encourage um, the staff to make sure they have some sort of written formal privacy directive that they can say that they have truthfully say that they have shared with uh, the county staff who's involved in this process. I also want to encourage staff to uh, step up the noticing efforts. I just think with the, uh, all the noise in the background, uh, folks are not um, likely to process this information if it's tucked in the middle of a newsletter or a card about other issues. Um, and I think we know from experience that uh, as much as it may seem a relatively pedestrian activity, garbage pickup is something people take sort of seriously. They think of it as a core service. And uh, they react when uh, things don't go according to expectation. So with that, I'll be uh, an abstention today, mostly as a way to register my concern that we get this right and not create a problem for ourselves during the course of the coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Do I have any other comments or a motion? Um, James, can we put 73 and 74 together or because they're ordinances, we do them separately, I presume? You can take them in one motion to approve okay. both 73 and 74. Okay, thank you. Nancy, could you please let our speaker in and then we'll take, uh, we'll consider taking both in one motion. 
Actually, Supervisor Advisor, I'm ready to make a motion to uh, for both uh, 73 and 74 to adopt the ordinance. Okay, we'll take the motion from Supervisor Lee first, and I'll look for a second, and then we'll turn to our speaker. Do I have a second? I'll if, second. A second by Ellenberg. Thank you. And now, Nancy, if you'll let our speaker in, please. Yes. Our next speaker is. Kimmy, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Kimmy, can you please unmute yourself? And Kimmy is not responding and that is our only speaker. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Lee, a second by Ellenberg for the adoption of the ordinance in 73, the adoption of the ordinance in 74, they were introduced in reading, I'll say was waived. Uh, preliminary adoption is today. Final adoption is on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day for both. Nancy, please. Oh take yeah, uh, may I make a comment to President Wasserman? Sorry. Oh yes, of course. All right, I just wanna mention that this item has been heard through the uh, RWRC and the change will help them in the incorporated area falls in line with the requirements of the SB 1383 to divert organic waste from our landfills. Uh, to achieve this, our staff with the, within the Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency, specifically the Recycling Waste Reduction Division, have been working with our existing franchise agreement vendors to implement these organic waste division by expanding the utilization of the green bins for both yard waste and organic food waste. The county is working with vendors to conduct on-site outreach for all tier one commercial edible food generators, such as supermarkets, grocery stores, food distributors, wholesale vendors, and institutional food service providers, of which there are approximately 20 within an incorporated uh, Santa Clara County, to make sure they have the appropriate containers of the initial streams and education so that they are able to comply with the new state requirements come January 2022. We have also reached out to all vendors to make sure that uh, appropriate language specific outreach and services are available so that all population are able to better understand the new requirements. Currently, the, the, all the data compilation that's required to produce the required reporting information for cow recycle is being handled by John Venture, who is a contracted agent handling this project and is handed over to county staff to transmit to cow recycle. And this is only at the educational phase right now and there won't be enforcement phase for at least another year. I just want to make that comment and thank you. Thank you, that was an excellent report. Whoever appointed you to the Recycling and Waste Commission really knew what they were doing. And uh, with that, Nancy, if you'll please uh, call for the vote. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Yeah. Supervisor Simidian? Abstain. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Westerman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. Nancy, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. That leaves us with item number 13. You see that? That, that is correct. All right, everybody, we're taking a five minute break right now. I will see you in five minutes and uh, then we'll address 13. Thank you. Recording stopped. Oh.